Hey guys, welcome to the Mass Effect Andromeda spoiler cast. Uh, I'm gonna just, I just want to start this one off with an apology, because this was supposed to happen like two months ago, and there's a few reasons why that didn't happen. Uh, first of all, if you're somehow coming out here from an outside perspective, this is a Let's Play channel. I do Let's Plays. Uh, and oftentimes when I finish the Let's Play during the credits, I'll do a discussion review summary thing on how I'm feeling about it. And oftentimes uh, when I play a bad game, I will often sit there and just go on a nice long rant about the things and all this and just all the things that I took issues with over the course of the game. And I try to summarize it retroactively. And some people have even gotten into the habit of when they don't like the game I'm playing, they will stop watching the series, but then come back for the finale and and skip to the credits and, watch that part basically uh, I didn't want to do that for this game right away a few reasons one of which was that uh, I had just been doing like a four hour session of wrapping up the game because like most Bioware games but especially especially like Dragon Age Inquisition and Mass Effect, Mass Effect Andromeda the uh, epilogue chapter is longer than the entire final mission like they have rel they both games had surprisingly brief, almost somewhat anticlimactic final encounters, but then like a brutally long uh epilogue by comparison. And uh after doing the long final mission and then like I think it was like an hour and a half of epilogue and saying goodbye to all the characters and everything like that, then the credits rolling, I'm like, I can't do this justice right now. The problem is the feeling of I can't do this justice stuck with me forever uh i kept i kept saying like i gotta i gotta get more notes together i gotta like summarize this and type up a bunch of stuff because i can't just do this off the cuff, cuff of my head there's too much it's not like a bad game i mean it's not like just talking about a bad movie and it's not just talk, like talking about like that one specific thing that ruined that game like this thing is such a train wreck while also being a train wreck that's about something I care about as opposed to just being something I can just ignore. Like, Anima Gate of Memories is a worse game, and I hated it more, but there was less to talk about by the end just because I didn't expect much of it compared to this. Uh, this is a game that follows up on one of my favorite franchises. In fact, one of my favorite games ever. And so that's why it's rough to have this game exist at all. So... There's upsides and downsides to the time that has passed. And by the way, my brain rejected this game. Uh, over the last two months, I have found that I don't remember this game exists on a regular basis. Uh, it's like people joke about the idea of like, there were no Matrix sequels and crap like that. They like joke about these ideas of just ignoring that certain things happened. But I found my brain actually, actually retconning this game out of existence. Like it would... I would have to remind myself it happened and I played it for like four months or something. So like you think it would stick, but, uh, I had myself doing that automatically. So like the only reason I even am doing this right now is because people keep reminding me in the comments about the spoiler cast that I promised to do. And I'm like, Oh, Oh, not only have I not thought about that spoiler cast for like the last two weeks or something, I also haven't thought about the game a single time in that span of time. Like it's amazing how quickly it can just be gone. And I can just move on being happy, not thinking about it. Uh, but let's get this out of the way, finally. There's a, up, there's upsides and downsides of the times that, that's passed. Obvious downside is some details are going to be lost here. Ultimately, the only best way to get my raw, immediate reactions to stuff while the game was happening would be to actually sit to the Let's Play. And I don't really expect you to do that because that's like... 60 hours that was a like i think it was like 120 130 episodes long and the last episodes were like an hour or two long and it's like that yeah i did a proper like 60 hour playthrough of this thing and was deep in the details and wallowing in the filth of the mess that it is and i you no one could ever summarize the sheer number of ways this game was a mess without making like a five hour video that was only made possible by taking notes the entire time uh because there's a lot to unpack here but there's one the the upside is hopefully that i get a somewhat different perspective over time as the thoughts recontextualize themselves a little bit and we can th and i can think about things a little differently and pose 
slightly different arguments than I did in the original playthrough, maybe. But I want to hone in on one particular detail, one particular moment. So we're going to show a clip from the Let's Play here, and it's uh, the Mushroom Rant, as people will remember it, <laughs> near the end of the playthrough. Uh, by the way, it's called Spoiler Cast. Full spoilers for Mass Effect 1, 2, 3, and Andromeda. It's the only way to really do this. So if, if you're somehow worried, if you haven't played the first three Mass Effect games, you should. Uh, and if you're somehow worried about spoilers for Andromeda, you really shouldn't be. But be my guest. Go ahead and play that game, too, if you really want to have the uh, blind experience. Uh, but I'll be spoiling the hell out of them. Uh, so at the end of Mass Effect 1, you get to a planet called Ilos. And it's a really memorable, burned-into-my-brain moment from when I was a teenager because it's impactful. You get to this really crazy-looking alien world that's a forgotten society, and there's these pods everywhere full of the bodies of the dead members of that society that were supposed to be in stasis until they could be woken up safely, but the war lasted so long that they all died one by one of those pods. And I bring this up because there's a visual here. You have tall vertical walls covered in pods full of people and on this planet you have the major revelation and actually two things happen one you're here because you think it's the ending you come here to finish the game and do the final thing only to find out it's not the final thing in this game's case it's because Saren uh it's because Saren has used the conduit to go to the Citadel and cause the actual ending scene to happen, which you need to go catch up with. And, and uh, this is where you have the big uh, revelation about elements about like what the Reapers do and what's going on. It's actually kind of the second revelation because they also had the the scene with Sovereign on uh, Vermeer. But this is your big chance to have big answers at, in this dead location and it's it it it's great it's great because mass effect 1 is great and there's so many incredible moments throughout it in mass effect andromeda you once again arrive on the second to last story location which you think is the last story location uh there's tall vertical walls everywhere and there are stasis pods all around you full of bodies and here you get one of the game's major revelations about the nature of the setting again before finding out that this is not actually the ending of the game and you need to go somewhere else next. And by the way, once again, uh, the villain is secretly going in and attacking you at your home directly. And you have to go back and save the people at the home base from the, new from the villain. It's like, holy shit. Holy shit, it's the same thing. <laughs> it's just the same thing. But it has less impact because they did it again, and also they did it worse, so it has less impact and it's less interesting because, uh, and right when I'm in that moment, right when that's happening in that game, in Andromeda, I go over to a mushroom, and that mushroom, because you can scan everything in this game, like Batman vision and stuff like that, you point at stuff and text comes up all the time, you point your scanner at this giant glowing fluorescent mushroom, and... It says that it's actually just a mushroom in appearance only. It's actually completely different from a mushroom. And then it stops. It doesn't say anything else. It doesn't explain how it's different from a mushroom. It just claims to be different and new and interesting when it's not. And if you can't sit through this whole video, <laughs> well, I get then that's the TLDR, I suppose, of this entire of this entire video. And uh, I'm just going to go ahead and play the original clip. It's going to be a little redundant to everything I just said, but it's... <laughs> it might speak to my emotional state uh, when I encountered it the first time and how I was feeling about the game and just let that... I'm not a yelling person usually. I'm not a overdramatic, angry video game nerd type person, but... Mmm. The venom in there. I am not happy. <laughs> Well, this evokes a visual, doesn't it? There's clearly... These are clearly pods for, like, bodies to be in. They look... It looks like they're all empty, apparently. But obviously this is supposed to look like Ilos, right? Ilos was the name, right? Yeah. This is a rem... Oh, there's some Mungarans here. 
Yeah, this is blatantly a remix of the planet where you find where you search for the beacon and stuff in a uh, in Mass Effect One, and find the remnants of the Protheans and Vigil. Monstrous fungi, organism best described in Milky Way terms as a giant mushroom. A deeper analysis indicates sim similarities are purely visual. It bears almost no similarity to the fungal organisms of the Milky Way. That, that there is one of the many lazy moments of writing in this game. It's like, this game is about exploring an entire galaxy completely unlike our own. We're supposed to be exploring the unknown. The very premise of this game is to scream at the player the concept of unbridled and unchecked creativity, newness, innovation, novelty. Boom. Forever. And what can they think of? They make a big mushroom. And then when you scan it, it's like, actually, it's not a mushroom. It's a crazy alien mushroom that's unlike mushrooms in every conceivable way, except for the part where we have to actually make it. And they don't say what- they don't even say what's different about it. They don't say what's different about it. They just make something that's familiar and call it new. Which is what this entire game has done. This entire premise is about innovation and novelty, and this in Microcosm shows how that fails and why it failed this entire game. Because they call it, they said we were gonna have a new adventure in a new galaxy where new things happen. It was gonna be a bold new direction for the Mass Effect franchise. But instead, we're just another chosen one saving another universe from another all-encompassing all super race of enemies that wants to indoctrinate and assimilate everybody. And they need to find the ancient technology mega thing floating in space that's gonna stop them. And nothing fucking- nothing- ah, oh, nothing fucking symbolizes that. Like being in basically the type of area that we got to at the end of Mass Effect 1. All over again. More of them telling us something old is new. Like a mushroom in space that's not a mushroom in space. Don't t don't call it a mushroom. Cause it's not a mushroom. It's just all we had to do was model a mushroom and put it in our video game and then just create a text document that says it's not a mushroom and not explain how it's not a mushroom. Just say it's not a mushroom. Just say it's new. Give them familiar old things and call it new. That's almost like innovating. Except it's not even remotely innovative. It's not what it is. It's not what this is. Ah! <laughs> so that last little rant I just went on, not the one from the Let's Play, but the one I did on this this podcast here was interesting because it got worse. <laughs> like, talking about it and trying to contextualize the thoughts actually can make some of the stuff worse because I started making realizations about just how many ways this whole th story was redundant and repeating upon itself while I was talking about it. Like, even though this was the thing I already ranted about and that set me off at one point, I made even more connections about how they were just using the same idea again, again, and that's, boy, boy, oh boy, oh boy. So there's a thing that happens nowadays a lot, which is the studio mandated reboot sequel thing, where you take some franchise that's popular either recently or a while ago or decades ago, and you just make another one. And it's always a disaster, more or less. You get your Death Note movie. You get the uh, the new Ghostbusters movie. You get a bunch of different things. The, the, do people remember still that there was a RoboCop movie? You guys remember that? There was a new RoboCop, like a few years ago. Do you remember that? Does anyone remember that? I think that's also how we're going to feel about stuff like the new Ghostbusters movie and other stuff like that, which, by the way, like, new Ghostbusters movie is blah. It's fine if you like Paul Feig movies, but I don't like Paul Feig movies, so I don't like it. That's There's nothing really bigger to say about that. Uh, but it's just some company that doesn't have anything to do with the creative process just says, this name makes money, make more of game or movie or thing that has that name. Period. And that's the whole motivation for it. And it's depressing. And you can tell when a game or a movie or whatever is, in, is an inspired follow-up or not an inspired follow-up pretty easily. Like, go watch Dread. 
I recommend very heavily that you check out the movie called Dread, which is a reboot sequel thing. I don't know. It, uh, much like Mad Max Fury Road, which is actually also another good example of like a thing coming back for good reasons. The movie Dread and the movie Mad Max Fury Road are sudden, abrupt returns to franchises that have been dead for decades. When's the last Judge Dread, Judge Dread movie? When when that come out? Was there even more than one? I think it was just the Stallone movie. And I think that was it. But then we, we had this surprise return with Carl Urban playing as playing Judge Dredd. And then we had the surprise return of uh, Tom Hardy playing Mad Max. And those were both movies that came from a very specific creative place. And there's somebody's vision. And you feel like you're watching a movie when you watch them as opposed to watching another corporate commercial as somebody tries to make their quarterly their quarterly budget meet ends like ends meet and stuff like that like it's it's not cynical it happened because somebody wanted it to happen and that's important to to notice the difference there because reboots and sequels are not inherently bad like mass like on a on a publisher level mass effect 2 and 3 happened because mass effect 1 was successful but on a creative level they were always going to happen. Mass Effect 1 is not... It is and isn't a self, self-contained self story. If you look at it as Shepard versus uh, Saren and Sovereign, like that part is self-contained, but it's obviously setting up some kind of series, likely a trilogy because we like 3 so much. Uh, and that was always going to happen. And you can feel the difference here. And much like that, like, yeah, Mad Max, Fury Road... Fantastic movie, possibly the best movie of the year. Dread, maybe not quite that level, but it's really, really good. Please watch Dread. Nobody remembers this movie already because nobody saw it in the first place. But it's it, it it's it, it, no one watched it probably because they're so burned out on these shitty uh, reboots that are like the RoboCop movie that should have never happened. But Dread was actually a good one, and I think everyone skipped it because one, Judge Dread, who actually cares about Judge Dread compared to like RoboCop and stuff, but also uh, you assume inherently that a Carl Urban reboot of this thing is just gonna it's just gonna be that, but it wasn't. It was someone's vision, and what I can say with great confidence is that Mass Effect Andromeda, in many ways, is really not. It's not the good version. <laughs> it's not Mad Max Fury Road. Uh, this is a mo- this is a game that one way or another uh, should have never happened the way it did. Uh, first of all, Mass Effect Three ends in a way that makes it almost impossible to make sequels to the Mass Effect franchise. Uh, I spent the I spent many years assuming they would make another Mass Effect because it's EA and EA will always do that, and that's how they do things. Uh, but I, I really hoped it'd be a prequel, like the human Turian war or something where, yes, I know some people hate prequels because it's like, well, we know where it goes, so who cares? But I'm like, that's not the point. You basically play everything knowing how, where it's going to end be- even before you, it tells you where it's going to end. Cause almost every story is the, he- the hero's journey where you cut, you have a bad inciting incident at the beginning of the thing. And then you like build up your power and you grow as a person. And then you beat the big bad guy. Like fucking every story is so identical in its basic structure. Like on some of those elements that like, I'm not really bothered by prequels. Like, Oh no, we know what happens later. I'm like, so I want to see what happens now. So like a human Turian war thing. I was interested in seeing that kind of thing. Uh, instead they did. <sighs> the most cynical thing that always happens, which is there's an ongoing thing now called the soft reboot, which is basically what cowards do when they're writing fiction. It's the most cowardly shitty thing ever. And I hate it and I'm tired of it, which is that basically there's some big corporation that's like this name needs more things attached to it and we need to make more money off this name. So let's make more money off this name here studio we now commission you to make this shit and you don't have a choice really uh good luck uh <laughs> and so they're like okay well you have to make a sequel to mass effect 3 that's impossible because mass effect 3 is ending uh first of all is like the most divergent decision in most rpgs in many ways so right off the bat you pretty much have to like 
you can't account for all the options there because they're too divergent. So right off the bat, you're going to have to dissatisfy the audience even further, which the audience was already largely not happy in many cases about the Mass Effect 3 ending, but you're going to have to make it even worse by uh, pulling a uh, Deus Ex Mankind Divided and just say that one of the answers is the canonical one. Because Deus Ex Human Revolution ends with a bunch of options at the end. And some of them are actually interesting, although it is definitely kind of bullshit to just be in a room where you press a button, and that's like, the button you press is the ending, haha, ha, which is what Mass Effect 3 did also. Uh, but Deus Ex's solution, as far as I could tell when I was playing Mankind Divided, is it seemed they just picked one of the answers as being canonical, which seems accurate, because in some of the endings you're explicitly told that certain characters will die, and those characters are super definitely alive in the sequel, so that, obviously, those aren't canonical, but they might have just retconned the entire ending or something. But in Mass Effect uh, Andromeda, like if you're trying to make a sequel to Mass Effect 3, like you'd have to pick one of those endings as being canon because they're too divergent in what they mean. Because it has gargantuan divergences just in, ter in terms of like whether the Reapers are, al are alive or not. Like That's a starter. But also one of the endings uh, s s mixes all organic and... Uh, but all organic and artificial organisms together, so everyone's both, which, man, like, just in case you guys are somehow thinking I'm a giant fanboy for the Mass Effect games and and only, hear, like, hopping on a hate bandwagon for Andromeda and will never criticize the original trilogy, feel free to look at the Let's Plays that I did, because I, I, I did uh, all three Mass Effect games back-to-back, -back, burning through them. I, I was... At first, I thought I was going to rush through them, but I actually like went through and did like, like nearly completionist runs of them and did it like hour long episodes every day so I could get through them so that I can do the Mass Effect Andromeda playthrough uh, with a fresh take on the trilogy up until that point. And there are some really dumb things that happen in the Mass Effect original trilogy, and they mostly revolve around the arrival DLC for Mass Effect 2 and the ending for Mass Effect 3, is where like the giant gaping plot holes come in. And yeah, Mass Effect 3 ending. It's bad. It's really bad. And they tried to expand on it to fix it. But honestly, I think they would have been better off reducing the ending to fix it. My In my head, the way that I try to fix the ending from Aspect 3 is that the button just works. That's it. It doesn't fix everything ever, but it, it carves off almost everything bad. And yes, it turns the it lets the crucible be a magic war ending machine, which is kind of a bummer in a Wesley saves the ship deus ex machina kind of way, but at least it's a machine you spent the entire game working on. Like the idea of a mass of a sci-fi game or even a fantasy game all being about you working on this magical thing that's going to solve your problems by the end of the game is not completely unheard of. So while it's not the most creative thing ever, at least it's there. So in my version of the story, you have this showdown with the showdown with the uh, elusive man, which I thought was decent. I thought that was, like, there was some issues. It wasn't as good as the Saren indoctrination plotline from the first game, which is an issue the trilogy has, is it often can't top stuff that happened in the first game sometimes. Uh, but in my head, like, that, sh hap that showdown happens, Anderson gets shot, and it's tragic that Anderson's dying, and you press the button, and it destroys all of the Reapers like it was supposed to do. And you slump down next to Anderson. You're dying, but you'll probably survive. Anderson has your fi his final talk with you, and he dies. And there you go. You won the war. Anderson got to see you that the war was won right before he died. Have some nice goodbyes with all your friends. Roll the credits. Like, it's not hard to get a better ending for Mass Effect 3. Because what I'm talking about here involves mostly just deleting shit from the game. You can just have the scene where Shepard presses the button and then show the scene where all the Reapers explode from the destroy ending and don't get into any of the bullshit about how, like, it's going to blow up all the mass relays and everyone's going to die and every AI you've ever met will die and the Geth will die and also everyone that came here to help you with this war will all die because they can't eat human food and they're stranded here forever and will never see their homes again because the Mass Effect relays died. But also when a Mass Effect relay explodes, it takes out the entire system it's in. So actually the Mass Effect relay in the Earth system took out Earth. So this whole war was pointless. I fucking... I hate the Mass Effect 3 ending. 
I hate the Mass Effect 3 ending for the same, and I'm, I'm talking about this for multiple reasons. One, it's a little iffy to rehash Mass Effect 3. I get that, but like it's kind of pointless at this point. But I want to talk about it because it's going to inform my opinion of a lot of what happens throughout Mass Effect Andromeda. And so I'm going to dwell on this for a little bit. Because in Mass Effect 3, in the real ending, what actually happens in the game, instead of my version of the events that is shorter, more concise, cleaner on a narrative level, and takes a few shortcuts, but is it's emotionally satisfying, which can make people overlook plot holes... Emotionally satisfying ends to trilogies are more important than logically satisfying endings to trilogies because trilogies are complicated ass stories and getting every single plot point and thing to always make sense and tie up perfectly is very difficult, which is why the ending of every television show ever usually sucks because how the hell do you make it all add up to something? But just being triumphant at the very least and making it feel earned, which the game would have done because you, you earned it at that point, uh, would have fixed the ending. And like, I can go right now on YouTube and edit a better ending to Mass Effect 3 with that, with, without much work. Like, it, I can take the scenes that already exist and reorder them a little bit, and then you could just add an epilogue where you say goodbye to everybody. Uh, ah. But it, it, I want to, inf but the reason why, when you, in the real ending, why it's such a mess is because aside from being such a weird, messed up, unsatisfying conclusion to the whole thing, it doesn't make sense on like a hundred different levels and it's infuriating and you just want to ask the game questions that won't be answered because like I just said, like if you think about what you know about the ending, all that shit I just said starts happening and it, it ruins the ending and you're like, oh fuck, because in the real ending you get on that, what happens, you press the button and instead of blowing up all the reapers, nothing happens. And then you you watch Anderson die. Anderson dies, not knowing that the plan failed. Uh, and then everyone's like, it's not happening, Shepard. What are you going to do? And Shepard goes back up to try to do it again. And then the uh, elevator comes down. And you ride an elevator up to what we call the Star Child, I guess. I don't know if the game ever calls it anything like that. But it's a fitting enough thing to call it, I guess. It's a hologram of a little boy, which you've seen in your dreams. Which, ugh, fuck. Fine. Uh... And he starts giving you the explanation of your deus ex mankind divided, I mean human revolution ending, which is you're in a room, there's three buttons, pick a button to press, it gives you a different ending, and the explanations for each ending are infuriatingly simplistic. Because they he makes, it's all grand gestures and dramatic things, like the Mass Effect relays will explode, cybernetic people will be destroyed, or organic people and cybernetic people will be merged, and all these other different versions of the story. And in fact, I believe, in, I think they even say that in every ending that the Mass Effect relays will explode, and it's like a nightmare to even think about what they're talking about. And you, all you want to do is like, hey, can you clarify that a bit? Can you answer that question? No, no. What That thing you said, can we talk about that for a second? What does that mean? What does that mean? And this is not an unreasonable explanation, uh, expe expectation to have on this franchise, by the way, because this is Mass Effect. I want to point out that Mass Effect 1, which is still the best Mass Effect, uh, <laughs> you can go into your codex entry and find out how your gun works. And they put so much detail into this these explanations of how parts of the game work that the game will give you detailed... Vo they'll, some some half of them are voiceovers. Like you can have a narrator read the codex to you for like half the codex, and yeah, they'll tell you like the way that your gun works and the reason why it doesn't have to reload is that it like take it has a giant block inside of it that is the ammo block and it shaves off chunks of that and hi and then hyper accelerates it forward and that's the projectile. So it has functionally basically infinite ammo because it's actually firing tiny projectiles that are only a tiny, tiny, tiny percentage of the block that it's being fed off of. But the process of shaving them off and firing them, that that generates heat. And so that's why if you shoot too fast in Mass Effect, then you you overheat and you have to wait for your gun to stop overheating so you can fire again. Which is a the thing they went away, they threw away in every sub subsequent su sequel. But even in those games they still stuck to their definition. They weren't like, guns use bullets now. They were still like, no, you have heat sinks now. Now, instead of the heat meter rising and falling and you have to pace, and you having to pace your shots like melee attacks in Dark Souls, now you have a clip 
that's a thermal clip, and it's a heat sink for your gun, so you need to swap it out for another heat sink over and over again. So you're still reloading bullets like in every video game ever, because that's what people apparently wanted when they bitched about the actually interesting system the first game had. Uh, they still like they're st they still refuse to just say it's bullets. Like no. We're still using the heat system. Guns still work the same way. We're going to have a thematically consistent explanation for how the mechanics in this game work. And we're going to explain it. And you can read about it. And you can get answers for the most minute shit in this franchise. And that's because Mass Effect 1 is very, 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 very influenced by Star Trek. Where you're going to hear about tachyon beams and particles and dark matter and all this other shit that, like, is... It's... It's the parts where people, it's the Dr. House scenes where the guy, the expert says stuff and you're like, okay, okay. And then they summarize it in a metaphor and you're like, oh, okay, so that's what's going to happen. And then they do, and then they solve the thing. But like the important part about those scenes went with Geordi and whatnot in Star Trek is that like, there is an internally consistent reason for shit happening in the universe. Is the difference between hard sci-fi and, and soft sci-fi, fantasy uh, science fiction versus science fantasy, basically. And the whole franchise has science fantasy elements, but this first game in particular was the hardest uh, sci-fi of the franchise, and they got looser with it over time as it became more of an action game series and more of a more Star Wars-y over time. But it hits a breaking point and betrays you when you hit the ending of Mass Effect 3, because up until now, you can always ask for explanations for pretty much anything that comes up, and you can talk for 10 fucking minutes about almost anything that happens in the game with another character who knows about the thing that will talk to you about it because there are reasons for stuff in the Mass Effect franchise. It respects and it respects the player enough to want to know the reasons for those things. Uh, in the Mass Effect 3 ending, we hit the phase of stop asking questions, stop asking questions, stop asking questions. Just accept it, just accept it, just accept it. Just do the thing that I tell you is going to happen. And just just accept it, period. But and it's like that's not that's not okay. You can't just do that at the end of a franchise and suddenly expect the player to stop asking questions in a game that constantly encourages you to ask questions about what's going on. And so it's not a satisfying ending to just have people have no idea what the decisions mean at the end of the game. Like, can you tell me whether Earth survives from ending to ending based purely on just what the Star Child tells you as opposed to like fan canon or what a wiki says somewhere or stuff like that? Like it becomes a nightmare. Like this is a complicated universe where like the Turians and the Quarians and stuff like that can't eat human food and they have come to the Earth to save it. And we have two things that are a, a nightmare here. One if the Mass Effect relays are disabled, then none of those people can ever go home, and they're going to starve because they can't eat the food in our solar system in any way. And also, there's a gargantuan population we're just going to influx into Earth, apparently. Uh, but two, if the Mass Effect relays are destroyed, if that's how it works, then they, then that'll destroy the entire system and blow up Earth anyway, because the Mass Effect relay is like... Wasn't it on, like, Mars or something? It's not even that far away, if I remember correctly. Uh, and we had, and you can't say this is a minor detail because we spent an entire DLC called the arrival dealing with the idea of how an entire area gets blown up when a, when a mass relay gets destroyed. And you can't even treat that as optional content because it is DLC, but it's not optional because of the fact that Mass Effect 3 starts off with that plot point. The first plot point in all of Mass Effect 3 is how an entire system gets wiped out by the destruction of a mass relay. And yet the game ends telling you that Mass Effect relays will be destroyed and even shows a cutscene of the Normandy fleeing across the galaxy while all of them are blowing up. And but none of the, but doesn't really acknowledge the fact that of what that means and doesn't really give you a it, like it doesn't hand wave it away. It doesn't explain, oh, but it's not gonna like wipe out the systems. It's they're just gonna turn off. It's like, what? How did you forget this detail? It's the first plot point and last plot point of the entire game. They're the same plot point, and you didn't you didn't you didn't reconcile them with each other. What the fuck? And so that's why Mass Effect 3's ending is so garbage, is stuff like that. The, like, the part where one of, first of all, the fucking Star Child ending three point, three point thing comes out of nowhere, whereas the Crucible just working would have been earned because the whole game was about the Crucible just working, but that, where the ending just comes out of nowhere, and so that's so it's not satisfying on a structure level, but it's not as satisfying on an emotional level, and because all you, like, this is a franchise about characters. Mass Effect 1 
is a game about plot. Like Mass Effect One has characters I cared about, and I played it over and over again, and I will st- I will still talk about the strength of the characters in Mass Effect One, but the core plot and the central narrative, like that, was the focus of Mass Effect One. But Mass Effect Two, Mass Effect Three. They became character-driven games. Mass Effect 2 was about putting together this gargantuan party, one of the biggest parties I've ever seen in an RPG, especially modern ones where they have to animate them in 3D and shit like that and voice them. Uh, It's a huge party, and the DLC just added two more to that party. And even the DLC characters, while having some, like, shortcuts in them that are disappointing, were still, like, fleshed-out characters that you feel like you know. And at that point, like, ugh have the ending of Mass Effect 3 not care about the characters is brutal. Like you have a bit of a good like you have a bit of a goodbye and that part's really well handled. And in fact Mass Effect 3 I still hold up as being a good game for so many reasons because it understands that closing all these plot points and dealing with all these characters is important. It deals with the Krogan genophage. It deals with the Rachni. It deals with so many different things. Some things do better than others, but who the fuck doesn't feel stuff when, like, the the Morden elevator scenes happen and stuff like that? Like, that's why I still say Mass Effect 3 is a good game in so many ways. And it is even a good ending to a trilogy, except for its ending. Because its ending sucks, but it's a good ending for a three-game arc in many ways, except for the actual ending part. Because the game itself is an ending for storylines you've built up over two, over three games, all throughout its game. It's a game about endings that ironically is bad at ending. <laughs> and that's a problem. So they get it right by having the part where all the characters are like having a final farewell with you, either in person or on the or on the hologram, and you see how far you've come and where everyone's ended up, and some of them are with you and some of them aren't with you, and it's it's good. But then the ending, the real ending of the game, puts all of those characters in jeopardy and doesn't explain what happened to any of them. And that's the number one question everybody has finishing Mass Effect 3 is, okay, like, what's up with Miranda? What's up with Liara? Like, and one by one, you go through the list of any character you care about and you're like, Ooh, what happened to Garrus? Is Garrus okay? What is he dying? Is he going to starve on Earth? Did he explode in a Mass Effect relay? Is he on that ship? Where'd that ship go? Where's the Normandy right now? Uh, Joker, you guys landed in a forest somewhere? What the fuck's happening? You want to know what happened to these characters you care about, and the game won't tell you. Uh, this is what they tried to fix with the Citadel DLC. By the way, I never planned on talking this long about the original Mass Effect trilogy, but I guess we're just doing this. This is what happens when you have me talk about Mass Effect, a franchise I care about a lot. And that's why it's so such a bummer when some of it goes wrong. But, uh, this is what they tried to fix with the Citadel DLC. Which is that they gave you a cathartic ending for every character. It does not canonically take place after the ending. It takes place before the ending because nothing canonically can take place after the ending with the way they set it up. But it still feels like it takes place after the ending, basically. You can almost picture it like if this was a television series, it'd be the part where the big horrible thing happens at the end of the series, and then you have a flashback episode to something you've never seen before, but it takes place beforehand, but it feels like an emotional arc ending to what was happening. And that's what it was. It was a final farewell to all the characters, and it it didn't actually fix the ending to Mass Effect 3, but for a lot of people it felt kind of like it did fix the ending to Mass Effect 3, because you got to say one last goodbye to all these characters and you got to see them all together in new combinations that they hadn't seen before stuff like grunt and rex and uh garrus and morden and not maybe not morden because morden can die in that game uh and uh zaid and all these different characters interacting with each other and you have drunk tally and all this stuff and like that if you like a lot of people in their head canon are like they make up a version of the ending that matches what i said which is that you you press the button on the Crucible, it just works, and then the Citadel DLC happens as everyone's celebration of the ending. Like, Mass Effect is over, we beat the Reapers, oh no, it's a clone of Shepard, let's all get together one last time for a big, big bad last final mission. Hooray! It's actually, this is actually more fun than it is threatening and stuff like that. Like, that, that's why they did that. Is because they wanted to fix the ending to their game, but they couldn't without literally replacing it. Although I, I still feel like my idea works. Uh, so they gave us the Citadel DLC, so it at least feels like there's an emotionally cathartic ending. Because like I said, when you're invested in characters, when you're invested in the world of something, an emotionally satisfying ending is more important than a logically satisfying one. And the problem was that 
the final, final, final ending of Mass Effect 3 was succeeded at neither. And that was a problem. It almost succeeded at being an emotional ending if it hadn't immediately jeopardized all those characters in unexplained context that it never acknowledges properly. And it also largely makes no sense, so you can't even try to trace the line of, like, where is Garrus right now in this ending? Um... Bleh. So the reason I bring this up, besides just trying to verify that I do criticize the shit out of original Mass Effect trilogy, because I did, did get off the rails at some point, but it's, I still re hold it up as good, is that this is going to continue to be a problem in Mass Effect Andromeda. Mass Effect Andromeda doesn't care about explanations. And if you want to get into the details of what's going on, you're not going to be happy. Uh, Mass Effect Andromeda is jam-packed with these cases of stop asking questions, stop asking questions, stop asking questions. But you've been trained by Mass Effect to ask questions, which is why it's so infuriating to have the game tell you not to. Uh, and it doesn't literally tell you not to, but it's like it will just throw something at you in one sentence that completely, like, fucks with everything you understand about the Mass Effect franchise and then it'll just move on and you can't ask a question you can't you usually can't even go into like a codex entry that gives you a satisfying alternate answer or anything it's just like it just stops it's just it reaches its ending and it just does what it, it just it just says the one thing and it sounds insane and never follows up on it and you're like what excuse me and i knew i was in trouble at the very beginning of the playthrough like like some people accuse me of ban hopping on bandwagons for criticizing this game, but I was playing this game in a bubble with no outside feedback at first, and without hearing anyone else complain about Mass Effect Andromeda, I had already encountered the Geth Telescope. Woo! So, what happens is that at the beginning of the game, you're being told about the Andromeda Initiative, and nothing about it makes sense, really. I guess I should talk about the story, because I haven't yet, of Mass Effect and Andromeda, like what its setup is. The idea here is that, uh, the idea here is that at some point, somebody believed Shepard. Shepard's warning everybody about the Reapers and the end of civilization and the end of the Milky Way, and somebody apparently believed him and set up this thing called the Andromeda Initiative. Everyone gets in these giant things called arcs. They're super ships. And what they're going to do is they're just going to go shooting off into space using a form of acceleration that like makes you accelerate very slowly, but you get to ridiculous speeds over time. And which and that makes sense because you're doing a super long journey. And these tens of thousands of people are all going to go into stasis pods on the ship and just go unconscious and just sleep. For this 600 year journey from the Milky Way to the Andromeda Galaxy. That's, they're going through dark space. And through the nothingness. And uh, that's... The idea of sending an arc to a different galaxy. Doesn't necessarily break Mass Effect. But the idea that in Mass Effect franchise. Like nobody believed Shepard. For like the entire trilogy. And that was the that was like that was a that was like an important plot point, and it was a heavy, frustrating plot point. Is that people kept not believing Shepard, and basically no one believed Shepard until the beginning of Mass Effect Three, in which point everyone believed Shepard because everyone's homeworlds are under attack by Reapers. And you're like, you fucks, we had two games for you to listen to me, and now we're not ready. Thanks a lot. Which like, at some points. Like, I don't think it's actually a plot hole, but it's, it is frustrating in the original Mass Effect trilogy how that actually happens. But, you know, fine if that's where they want to go with it. But the Andromeda Initiative would have us believe that not only did somebody believe Shepard, this person had in ungodly massive resources, incredible, ridiculous resources, uh, got almost every important council race and so on to work together to make these super arcs and then put tens of thousands of people on them, and then send them to Andromeda, all on the whim of believing Shepard, while simultaneously not believing Shepard officially, uh, and then none of this was ever going to come up in the original Mass Effect trilogy? The idea that you'd somehow never hear about this at any point, when this inc incredibly gargantuan project, one of the most, one of the most large-scale projects in not only Mass Effect's entire series, but also, like, maybe in 
of any Bioware game, like the, the scale of this project is is un, impossible. It's like insane how many like there's like a like, there might be like a hundred thousand people involved in this at some point. I don't remember the exact scale, but like there's so many people overall, and it's so big that like who's like the idea of who's funding this and who how is this even possible is so hard to accept on any level. It's either the it's either the governments themselves, which then you're like, why are these governments funding the, the process of of uh, letting a bunch of people just take off on these mega ships when they should be really trying to figure out how to defend their home worlds, which they completely and utterly fail to do and seem to not be prepared for. So they clearly weren't believing Shepard. Or it's some mega corporation, incredibly valuable thing. The most thoroughly suggested thing is that it's Cerberus, which is like, what the actual fuck? Because Mass Effect 3 was already straining our believability on Cerberus and their capabilities and powers and what like not, not what like and stuff like that. Like I was already mad at Cerberus and Mass Effect 3 because I'm like, humans are new at the galaxy. In one lifetime, we're one lifetime into being in the galaxy, and we're seen as like bottom feeders. Like in real life, when there is like some kind of uh, disliked and oppressed sector of society. And it doesn't, you can think of a hundred different examples. It's not exactly hard. Uh, you can, it, hundreds of years pass and you usually can't fully rise to the top and really overcome the oppression that happened in the past. So like, it's one thing to have uh, humanity frustrate the council's uh, races by with the way that it keeps like rising up over the course of the original trilogy uh, over and over again. But you can at least excuse that on some level of like maybe it's like because you know what Shepard does and stuff like that and like how driven humans are and stuff like that. But like the idea like humans weren't usually contextualized in the original trilogy as being the most powerful race. They were just a race that was frustrating other races by becoming powerful too often. In fact, it's one of the first plot points that you can encounter in Mass Effect 1 is that you reach the embassies on the citadel and you talk to a hanar and you talk to a volus and the volus is mad at humans and just blatantly racist against them because they and and for reasons that are actually pretty believable which is that they've been here for thousands of years and they still don't have a seat on the council and they still don't get respected the respect that they feel they deserve within uh council space and humans just are, seem to be carving their way in uh, in in a margin of that time a single human lifespan because i'll remind you that people like anderson and stuff like that fought in the human turian war which was first contact that's how short the light the the span of time in which mass mass effect has humans in space and dealing with aliens which is why it's hard to do prequels to some extent and and do anything else with that time frame like there's a single human lifespan in which humans meet aliens and the ending of the Re reaper arc happens in one human lifespan which is for example anderson's uh there's very it's hard to do much with that time and know what to like like to have more wiggle room there but like i can accept when it's just like humans are encroaching on stuff and other people being mad at them like i can i can accept all that stuff the galaxy has a set way of things new people haven't been incorporated into its society for a long time everyone kind of has their territories and whatnot and so people are mad about humans moving in and they're like no you get the you get the outer reaches go over there in the dangerous part of space next to the uh, the people that aren't council races that are likely to attack you and like that's that's great I love that part of the Mass Effect trilogy and how it how it treated humans. But then it turns around and gives the Cerberus organization who like ultimate power. And like in Mass Effect 3 it's already unbelievable that this there's apparently this single organization that stems from humanity that has such limitless resources that they can single-handedly mount an assault on the Citadel and like bring it to its knees if if uh Shepard can't successfully stop that. Like that's that was frustrating already in Mass Effect 3 when they went when they did that. But here we get peak absurdity, which is this idea that like the most commonly accepted explanation, and I and it's been so it's been a while now, so I can't even tell you I can't remember with 100 percent certainty if uh Andromeda actually specifically claims that Andromeda was made by in it, uh, Cerberus or if it was just heavily hinted throughout the entire game but that's the most common answer people give so far about how the andromeda initiative happens that cerberus somehow made it and that's all that's an, that's just unacceptable 
the idea that during Mass Effect 3 they have such resources that they can assault the Citadel, but also at the same time in the background they were working with all alien races to seed other galaxies uh, with an incredibly impossible number of people. Like, first of all, how does Cerberus have the resources to work with all those different uh, people and make this gargantuan project happen while also planning on assaulting the Citadel and also doing all the other shit they do throughout all of Mass Effect 3 that also required seemingly limited, re limited uh, limitless resources? But also, why are they working with all these aliens? Why wouldn't they just be making a human arc and nothing else? Like, I don't... I'd, I've heard several different explanations for the Andromeda Initiative's very existence, and none of them are acceptable to me at all. Next up, we have, and to get to the actual topic at hand, uh, did I even finish explaining the plot before I started just jumping into plot holes? I don't remember. Uh, but basically, yeah, somebody believed Shepard. Let's, and they're like, well, this galaxy is doomed. Let's seed another galaxy, basically. And so they're just going to send these arcs full of tens of thousands of people, which you can't even begin to explain how these arcs exist. So they mostly just don't. <laughs> uh, and they go off to Andromeda. And we'll get to the state of Andromeda later, but that's the premise, the setup of this game. And I and I think at the end of the game, you finally uncover this video that ex that that's from the benefactor of all of the Andromeda Initiative. And even then, like they're hiding the identity of them. It's a video of them shifting between every different race, so you can't even tell what race the person is that's talking, or what gender, or who they, what they sound like, or anything. And they just, and I think they were just vague. I don't remember them really nailing it down, but if they did say anything, I don't think that their answer was satisfying for me. Uh, it's a mess. But uh, when you once you um, once you arrive in Andromeda, and some and some of the basic start setup stuff happens, they, they some more explanations start to come. And here's where things get even messier. Okay, first of all, they have the que like they have the question of how did people view Andromeda exactly? And and what we're gonna establish here is we're gonna have a series of things where they answer the surface level question. Because you're gonna ha when you look at the Andromeda Initiative, you'd have a series of different questions, like say, uh, how does one look into a different galaxy to see planets that somebody could inhabit? And their answer is going to be Gath Telescope. And if you want to ask the next question about what the fuck that means, they just said, that's when the questions stop. <laughs> so they, they always go one question deep at, at answering questions about the world that the game you're playing in now, and then they stop. And that's very not Mass Effect. That's infuriating. Like Mass Effect 1 where they're like, here's biotics, it's magic psychic powers, and we're going to literally make an entire character dedicated to explaining the process of like how there's multiple layers of human implants and they made they made different like iterations of them over time and Caden is this unfortunate uh like he's got the L2 implants so he is, he gets feedback and he actually suffers throughout his life for the ability to use this thing that he was that he's kind of stuck with anyway, and like he, there, there's hardships built in this. Like there's details here, and it's important to point out here that details are not bad. Because look at Caden. Yes, Caden's kind of boring. Other than that stuff, but the L2 implant stuff is interesting, and it's worth acknowledging this because getting bogged down in the details isn't just nerdy explanation for the sake of nerdy explanation. It is a source of storytelling and character drama. Like, learning about how implants work and stuff like that will explain how various side quests happen throughout the game, the motivations of certain characters, how a mechanic in the game works and who can use the thing that is the th mechanic, and also giving you character drama on the, in the form of Caden about how it affects somebody li somebody's life and expands upon their character and makes them more interesting than they would have been without that detail. So answering these questions and getting bogged down in the details improves Mass Effect stories. It does not distract from them. And that's why it's good to fully explore these ideas. And that's why it's so frustrating when they don't answer these questions in, in Mass Effect Andromeda. Uh, the cat, they just say Geth Telescope. They say that somebody got in contact with the Geth or salvaged from the Geth some kind of technology that lets you use Mass Effect fields in order to telescope better which 
is about all they really say on it. And I'm like, first of all, how were you dealing? Like, I, I think they specifically said that they were even cooperating with the Geth. I'm like, who is cooperating with the Geth? Because, like, the Andromeda Initiative supposedly happens between Mass Effect 2 and Mass Effect 3 or during Mass Effect 2. And it's important to note that every Mass Effect game takes place over the course of about a year. And they're pretty much back-to-back -back years. Like, they're really... They're close together games. So, in Mass Effect 1, the Geth are enemies. In Mass Effect 2, the Geth are mostly enemies, but you kind of start learning about the different factions within them. And, and for the most of Mass Effect 2, they're actually kind of just a distant race that's not getting involved in most of Mass Effect 2, aside from the Quarian stuff. And then in Mass Effect 3, the Quarian Geth War is ramping up. At what point in the story is anyone going to be able to deal with Geth technology and stuff like that and, and, and get this Geth telescope? Like, it doesn't match any real part of the timeline of the universe that it's based in, so it doesn't work as an explanation. But also, just talking about basic physics, what the fuck is a Mass Effect telescope? What? Nothing about how Mass Effect works in this franchise ever indicates how a Mass Effect telescope would work. Like, and they say, I think they even said the, that the Geth telescope was a, mo was a modified mass relay. And it's like, that's not how mass relays work either. Because the way that mass relays work is that there are pairs of relays basically pointing at each other. And when you go to one, you essentially teleport to the other one. It like shoots you through, it, it shoots you through time and space to the other one, like a cannon that kind of ruptures physics in a way. That is a one-way trip. And it's from a it's from a starting point to a destination that are both mass relays. How does one telescope with one? First of all, mass relays only work when there's one on both sides. You can't just go from one mass relay to nothing. Like even in uh what's it called? Even in Mass Effect 2, when there is a suicide mission mass relay. That goes to another mass relay, it's just that on the other side, the collectors have modified that mass relay so you can't use it to do a return trip without certain codes. So you can't escape. It traps you. But it's still a mass relay that works on both sides of the process, because that's how they work. That's how they stick to the meaning of how Mass Effect relay w relays work throughout the entire franchise. They stick with it. How does one modify one to be a telescope? First of all, you can't... They're only senders. They're only really senders. They send you to another one. So without a second mass relay at the in Andromeda already, you can't really make them interact in the first place, based on the existing knowledge of how the mass relays work in this in this franchise. But also, how does one use one as a telescope exactly? Like we can accept the idea that they send objects through time and space, but how do you observe instantly across to another galaxy through a mass relay? Is it sucking? light at you like a telescope is a thing that accepts light into a viewfinder and you use that to see distant objects you can't like suck light at you like a magnet or something or like there's nothing and like that they, they don't come up with an in universe explanation for this they they just stop and like i've now had I think I've had a 5-10 minute conversation with myself just now about trying to talk about the ideas of mass effect relays being used as a telescope. But the game just says like one sentence and then moves on. But it's a core explanation of how the Andromeda Initiative can exist in the first place and it just moves on. It just stops. The end. Goodbye. That's the it. That was the old, that's all we get. Goodbye. The end. Fuck it. Ugh. That's it. Thanks. Okay. And that's going to keep happening, by the way. Uh, before long, they'll, they uh, start asking about, uh, let's talk about the popular races of Mass Effect, because we need to sell this game in bullet points to people. Uh, the first Mass Effect pretty much established all the aliens, except for like three of them. Uh, eh, four or five. They actually added a decent number of them over the course of the game. With some, they have varying importance. But the first Mass Effect, you already had the Council races, which are the Turians, the Asari, the Salarians. Then you have the humans, you have the Volus, you have the Hanar, 
you have the Elcor. I think I mixed up El- Elcor and Hanar when I talked about the Volus racism scene earlier. Uh, and then, uh, is there anyone else? There's the Rachni. Uh, there's a shitty little monkey fucks. I hate those guys. <laughs> um, those are the main ones. And then in the, then you start getting the harder to remember names a little bit as the times goes on, which there's the bring down the sky expansion, which adds the Batarians. Mass Effect 2 adds the Vorcha and the Collectors. And Mass Effect 3 has you finally meet a Prothean, which technically was established in the first game, but now you get, you actually know what Protheans are and stuff like that. Like that stuff tons of races each one has a specific character to them you can easily talk about what each race of mass effect is and i'm getting sidetracked here from the arc topic but i guess i'll just go into this issue of the races themselves for now because i've already gotten into it uh but like they got they use the star trek approach approach to races basically which is that each race has characteristics that are kind of true for most of the race and that's what that's that it becomes a shorthand on some level it's kind of simplistic to handle characters like this to have them have races all interact with each other but it's a popular trope for sci-fi and fantasy writing all the way down to where like dungeons and dragons will be like a green dragon those are lawful evil or something like that and it's like what dragons have an alignment just across their entire race that's kind of simplistic and yeah i I get that it's kind of a bummer at times but in the case of something like uh, Mass Effect or Star Trek, the point is that they're supposed to be exotic and different. You make these different races that are different from humans and they're defined from the perspective of humans in what ways they're different from humans. And so you got to lean heavily into those elements to make them feel different and special because otherwise everyone's just humans and that's a bummer because you don't want to go to space on your space adventure and just meet humans everywhere and they're just humans that act like you but they are but they are mad at you for stuff and that's it <laughs> like that's not as interesting as having klingons and salarians and the various races across all these different franchises like mass effect is better with krogans than it is without krogans krogans are an improvement in mass effect and so we have this nice, beautiful tapestry of characters. They kept adding more races throughout the franchise. And I believe that every single one of you listening to this, if you've played the Mass Effect trilogy, can explain to me easily the characteristic differences between each of the different races, what their personalities often are like, uh, what their politics are, how they interact with each other and how they feel about each other and stuff like that. That's important. Keep that in mind very important it's very important please remember that so then we get to mass effect andromeda and they're i'm sorry everybody we're gonna have to say goodbye to all those races for two reasons twice twice first of all you find out that there's only a salarian arc a asari arc a turian arc and a human arc so there's one arc for every council race and then the krogans are just there for some reason they also just found their way in there anyway. So there's five races. So first of all, immediately say goodbye to Quarians. Say goodbye to Volus. Say goodbye to Elcor and Hanar and Batarians and Vorcha and everyone. They're all gone now. You'll never see them in the entire game. You only have the vaguest reference to their existence from time to time as a, like a nod or fan service, and that's it. You're probably thinking right now that's like one of the strengths of Mass Effect's setting was all those races existing. Eh, too bad. They're gone now. But it gets worse. It actively gets worse. Because when you're playing Mass Effect Andromeda, before long you realize that the Salarians, the Turians, the Asari, and the humans are no longer races. They're one race. They're all the same. They're all humans. Period. There's nothing that sets them apart from each other besides appearance. And boy, oh boy, does that appearance not go far either. Krogans got away with being Krogans, thankfully. Uh, They have their own settlements. They still act like Krogans. There's... uh, I have criticisms of of their vocal performances. The Krogans often don't sound like Krogans in this game. And the Turians often don't sound like Turians in this game. And the Salarians often don't sound like Salarians in this game. They just decided to drop the vocal processing that they used for three games and just make them all sound like humans too which is a a bummer 
and which gets really distracting, by the way, because the leader of the Krogans and the leader of the Initiative are played by the same voice actress. It's that one. It's the uh, it's the uh, the trans woman from uh, that plays in the Netflix series Sense Eight. She plays the leader of the Initiative and the leader of the Krogans, and there's, it's clearly the same voice actor. And she shows up in three other minor characters too. And I'm like. This is where vocal processing would come in handy. If you sounded like a Krogan, you wouldn't be obviously the same person talking to me through several different faces. But anyway, Krogans at least act like Krogans. And that, that, and that that's satisfying to see for a few minutes, even though it, so, it comes so late in the game that it's hard to even... There's not much to redeem at that point. But Salarians, Turians, Asarian humans no longer act differently from each other. They also all look the same. Uh especially the aliens uh the asari you can't you can't put them up in a lineup and try to tell them separately from each other they all look like the same person repeating over and over and over again everywhere you go with and they seem they might as well have the same voice for all i can do to differentiate them from each other to the point where one of them is played by the uh the woman who played marjorie in game of thrones uh and she's on your ship but if you put her but whenever she leaves the ship to go onto the citadel would not the citadel but the game's equivalent of the citadel called the nexus uh you can't pick her out from a lineup <laughs> you cannot find her in a crowd you have to just hope that the game will highlight her saying that she's that it's lexi because you cannot tell her apart from all the other asari like how would you do you remember not being able to tell liara apart like ever like she was distinctive you could lose her in a crowd in that there was just tons of people and you had to scan each face one by one. But once you saw Liara in a crowd in Mass Effect 3, you would recognize her. And you're like, oh, there's Liara. Because she had distinctive things about her clothing and whatnot. And also, like, her mannerisms and appearance. Like, you, because you cared about her, that character and saw her a lot, when you saw her in a crowd and locked eyes on that character, you'd be like, oh, there, there's Liara in Mass Effect 3. I see her. Now, now I'll go talk to her. Uh, which is impressive because Liara has, she's just a blue Asari with, like, freckles. Like, she doesn't have dramatic face paint or anything she actually is like the generic template asari in many ways but you can pick her out and that's and that's because of the differences in the asari that helps uh present their differences in the original trilogy that goes away in this game lexi looks like every asari every asari seems to literally have the exact same face and they usually don't even have uh changes in markings they usually just have like a slightly different coloration and that's it the only asari in all of uh, mass effect 3 that looks different is pb and that's because they had she's a crew member and those are actually I'm not even not even just a crew member because crew members aren't super different looking either but she is at least a party member so they had to really focus on making her look different one of the explain one of their solutions was to give her, fa her face paint across her eyes which is very distinctive to be fair man I am only making a dent in my notes and we're like an over an hour and in. I'm going to have to, I might have to record this over multiple sessions just to and splice it all together to rest, just to rest my voice. <laughs> but, uh, all the races are the same now and it's a huge bummer. So immediately the mass effect setting is boring. It's the, like, uh, I'm gonna take a drink real quick. So I fell in love with mass effect one the moment I got to the Citadel. Boom. Some people bounced off at that point. I get it. Like, uh, I had multiple friends that got to the Citadel in Mass Effect 1, and they're like, what do I do? What, what's going on? What kind of game is this? And that that shock makes some sense, because Mass Effect 1, it opens with a hyperlinear shooter segment full of dialogue, and then dumps you in an open hub world with n that isn't super clear about what to even do to proceed. And you have to then explore that hub world and do several... Uh, relatively linear quests, but that are scattered across this the space you have to learn in order to proceed the story and finally get the ability to leave and get because you have to get the Normandy and everything like that and become a Spectre in order to even leave the Citadel. Uh, but immediately, there's so many races of people and so and so many like the within the Citadel there's, itself, there are multiple different settings with different like little subcultures and sort of neighborhoods to it. And different races are all interacting differently with each other and you like they like like how the Volos and Alcor clearly get along and have their own dynamic, but the Volos specifically doesn't want you there and stuff like that. Like that 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 stuff gets burned into your brain as memorable, interesting interactions. You get to the Nexus, and I'm like, okay, do it. 
do it Andromeda sell me on sell me on Andromeda this is it Nexus this is your Citadel and by the way it is the Citadel it is shaped like the Citadel it serves the same purpose as being the hub for all the different races and everything it's the Citadel and it falls completely flat it completely fails to even approach anywhere near what the Citadel did Everyone feels like the same person. People are just in crowds randomly talking about the most inane shit. And no one feels different or interesting. And you you just want to leave. Uh, when I played Mass Effect 1, I was, make, I was constantly making trips back to the Citadel to see what would change and what new plot points might show up. And what would happen with like that reporter and stuff like that. And like what developments there might be. Because new quests would show up from time to time. And that's because... Aside from all the interesting races and stuff like that, the Citadel was a place where you could walk into the wrong room and then be threatened by a self-aware AI that was invented to cheat at gambling that will threat that threatens to kill you because it's afraid of 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 being exposed and and wiped out. Like that was stuff that would happen on the Citadel. In the Nexus, it's a lot of boring commutes and walking around faceless people that are never interesting and are all just humans and nothing really happens and i whenever i got to the the nexus i couldn't i just couldn't wait to leave i just wanted to leave and go anywhere else and unfortunately the the everywhere else wasn't that much better but there's no desire to explore and be on the nexus and i forced myself to do it anyway and there's just not much reward for it unfortunately it's just a bummer and that stark difference is a bummer and just to call back to that mushroom rant from the beginning of this whole thing that goes back to the issue I talked about before about like they because this is such a cynical corporate game where they just do the same thing but again but worse this whole thing is like this whole game's optional this whole game's not really worth playing this game is this is not a game that has its own new ideas it's a game that wants to repackage the same ideas from the old game while not knowing why those ideas worked not having the creative spark to do anything new with those ideas and then just to accept expect like that pat on its head for what it got like well i did i gave you what you wanted right i gave you the races you had before visually only i gave you the citadel again visually only i gave you the same ending again but visually only with the same pods and the same revelations no no it doesn't work that way you can't just do that it doesn't work that way but they did blah 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 <laughs> I'm trying to recontact, just latch back onto where I was before I got here. But yeah, the races suck, and they're gone. They're functionally gone. This game doesn't have Asari. It doesn't have Turians. It doesn't have Salarians. It just has humans and Krogans, and the humans look like four different races now. And it's like they have skins. Congratulations, you got the premium skin. You got the Asari skin for your humans. Congratulations. Uh, but to get back to why I started talking about races in the first place is because each of them has their own arc. There's a human arc. Turian arc, uh, Salarian arc, and Krogan arc, and uh, then you ha have the one of the dumbest lines in the game, which is they talk about <laughs> how the Quarian arc has been delayed, and that's why they're not here yet. Uh, there are no Quarians in the entire game, but they tease you with the idea that the Quarian arc apparently has the Volus and the Hanar and the Alcar, and maybe even the Batarians, I'm not even entirely sure on it, like, that one arc apparently has all of the other races, like, half of them are all on one arc, apparently, that just isn't here for some reason, oh, that's weird, isn't that weird? Uh, fuck off, man, but, uh, ignoring that dumb explanation for where the other aliens are, let's just depack that for a second there, the Quarian arc is apparently a thing that exists, that's not that's not possible that's not possible for like every reason and anyone who even respects the lore of mass effect even a little bit and cared about these stories knows how impossible that is first of all one thing let's just get this little detail of the way really early on uh these council races are huge populations they're huge populations the quarians are nearly extinct they got obliterated when the Geth took their homeworld away from them, and they've been they've been busy being like space vagrants with their ships. They have the flotilla, 
and it's a bunch of they have limited space they pro their population cannot grow so they have a tiny population that will never not be tiny as long as they're in the flotilla and it is a tiny population like it's not like i, I think it's still big enough to be like bigger than like cities generally are and stuff like that on earth but uh, like it is it's a big population but like it's dwarfed i believe if i remember correctly it's easily dwarfed by the modern population of earth and stuff like that like they're in trouble they, so the idea that the quarians would just spare tens of thousands of people to just abandon their work first of all how are you finding all these quarians that are willing to just abandon the flotilla in its time of need but also how are you getting the okay from the Korean government to even sign off on this process? Because yes, uh, Koreans are not like humans where they're just floating fle fre freely throughout space, like a bunch of libertarians, just in crowds, like doing whatever the fuck they want, being pirates or whatever, be joining Cerberus. They don't, they don't have that super population. Koreans are not just found everywhere, littered every, like they not in significant numbers. There's always like one, like, look, that's the Corian on this planet. The one Corian. We found it. Uh, so you don't have spare change Corians lying around that can just self mobilize into being this thing. So in order to do this, they have to be from the government. The Corian government had to sign off on the idea of sending things off for this arc, which is a problem because the Corians don't give a fuck about anything besides taking back their home world that's the point of the storyline in mass effect 3 is that all they care about is taking back their home world they're not going to spare resources for any other reason that doesn't drive them back towards that purpose it's the single it's the singular like spiteful thing that keeps them moving as a species they need that in order to survive they need that goal and they stick to it uh, it's important to them uh, and if you remove that then they fall apart because how do they even keep the motivation to keep going? They would just settle somewhere and give up. The, the whole, like the fact that they haven't is itself a plot point. Uh, so the government would be required in order to mobilize this huge population to populate an arc the way that all the other ones did, apparently, which we're, we're still having to work with the assumption that that somehow happened, but at least it's more feasible for everyone that's not Quarian. But the idea that the Quarians just set, sent tens of thousands of people away from their primary goal is insane. Because one, they're dedicated to this mission full force. Two, uh, how? Like, even if they decided to do this, how would they do this? Like, to be clear, in the gap that in the transition from Aspect 2 to Aspect 3 is when the Korean Geth War starts. Like, again. And they're fighting over their homeworld. So the Korean Arc is impossible because the Quarians have a tiny population, limited resources, so much so that they have an entire pilgrimage thing where somebody, when they become, when they're coming of age, like the Amish, they get to go into normal society and they can choose whether to come back or not. But when they come back, they're supposed to try to bring a gift with them that will better the entirety of the Quarian arc because they're so limited, in, they're so limited in resources that your high school graduation is you going off to try to find a scout, a salvageable ship so that your society can keep working. That's how fucked they are. <laughs> So the idea that they could even do this is impossible, let alone the idea that they would do this when they're about to be in the biggest war ever that will literally wipe out their entire society, depending on what Shepard does. Like, Shepard has to make the right call that causes peace between the Quarians and Geth or wipes out the Geth in order for the Quarians to not literally die out in Mass Effect uh, 3. So the idea that they somehow have just resources and people to spare for a Quarian arc is completely insane. It's just nuts. Not to mention that they don't even eat the same food as the other people from that arc. So, like, why would those people be mixed up with each other in the first place? Like, if you're going to have Quarians for some reason coming to the Andromeda Initiative, shouldn't all those other people make an, make an arc together? Like, the Volus are supposed to be merchant, a merchant race. Aren't they, like, rolling in cash or something? They should probably, they could probably string together the stuff. Whenever you have, like, on a regular basis in the Mass Effect franchise, there will be some group of mercenaries or people working together, and then it'll turn out the whole thing's being run by a Volus because they've got the resources to roll in and mobilize this thing. It happens, like, three times, I think. So I could buy the idea that the Volus would organize a multi-species arc together, but the Quarians don't have the resources or the or motivation or the possibility because they, it, they, the Quarian Arc can't exist because they wouldn't make it. They can't make it, and they, and it doesn't make sense for them to live that way. 
it, the quarrying race, which is poor and limited and just the puppy that gets kicked over and over again in the Mass Effect franchise, if you're going to somehow hobble them over to Andromeda, they're going to be on the Turian arc because they can share the same resources and food, which is established over and over again in the core franchise. The real reason why the Quarian arc is not on the Turian, the, the Quarians are not on the Turian arc, is because this game had massive development problems, and so they didn't want to make Quarians. So they just didn't make Quarians. But they want to keep the door open for sequels and DLC so uh, for why uh, where they can add the races in over time that are missing this time around. Much like how like when a new Sims comes out, the new Sims lacks all the features of the previous Sims games and they, they sell them to you piecemeal over the next five years. They're planning on doing that with Mass Effect. Thanks, EA, again. Yep, they're both the same publisher. Fuck off, EA. Uh, <laughs> they're planning on selling the us the Quarians and the Volus and stuff like that, either in sequels or DLC. And that's why they tell us about this Quarian arc that somehow exists. And that's insane. Because, yeah, the Quarians would be on the Turian ship or they would not come. And by the way, the answer is they would not come. The entire Andromeda Initiative concept is the anathema to anything about the Quarians ever existing on it. Period. Like... And you should just acknowledge that and accept that and just let it happen. But what happened here is they have to promise Quarians because this is a this is not somebody's creative vision. This is not a story that exists for reasons other than money. So they they promise the idea of Quarians because they need to satisfy fans by promising Quarians, and also they hold it back, but then still promise to add it later, creating this giant plot hole because. That's their business model, is to sell things in the future. So they can't cut out the idea of Quarians coming in later because they want to make money off of stuff, and that's another thing they can tap onto, and they can't limit themselves. So they come up with this half-assed, tiny explanation that they refuse to answer questions about, about how the Quarians could be on this arc. And it's just like, what the fuck, man? Like, respect your players. This is a franchise built on respecting the players to care about its war and lore, its 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 world and lore and story to the point where after the first mission on Edo, on, um, Jesus Christ, um, something Prime, the first mission of Mass Effect One. I'm sorry, there's a lot of names to keep track of over this franchise. Eden Prime, right? Yeah, you do Eden Prime, and it's a, like here's your little like uh preview of what this game can be like, and now enjoy this town where you talk to people for four hours like that's mass effect was built on respecting us enough to think that we'd get through that and so caring about details and stuff is the basis and this game is almost insulting you for caring about these details it's just it's it's a huge bummer uh bruh. boy oh boy i think this might be multiple this is going to be so long, it might actually be multiple podcasts that it might be a part one and part two and so on of a spoiler cast because I'm not even, I've barely started my notes here. Okay. Sure. So we talked about the Andromeda Initiative, the Geth Telescope, the Quarian Arc. Let's get to the next step of the story, which is the actual arrival in Andromeda. So at the very beginning of the game, which by the way, we're just now talking about the first five minutes of this game. That's where we've gotten so far in this last hour and a half. So... Buckle up, buckaroos. <laughs> Although, honestly, the story is so undetailed and uninteresting that we'll actually spend surprisingly little, little time talking about the actual plot developments in this game because they are there's not much to talk about. They're either derivative from the first games or there actually isn't that much to them in even when there is something to them. It's just a, it's a bummer. In fact, if you play the entire story back-to-back, -back, this game might be done in a handful of hours, but you, I don't know if the game will even let you do that that fast. You might have to do the open world first and stuff like that. So, we arrive in Andromeda, and immediately bad stuff happens. There's some kind of dark matter tendril things going throughout space. It's bad cr space corruption. It's kind of magic. It's kind of bullshit, but whatever. The arc, the human arc, which is the one you're on, hits it, and it's disabled. And you, you were supposed to be arriving on one of the planets that was supposed to be inhabitable by your people. And, uh... <sighs> So, for some reason, even though you look at this planet below you and it's got a super storm on it and looks uninhabitable and it looks like a nightmare, we apparently decide to land on it anyway. So we send down all our important people to go take a closer look for some reason, which... Okay, sure, fine. Uh, you are Ryder. You are not the Pathfinder. 
The game says you're the pla- you're the pathfinder, and you will be the pathfinder, but not yet. Right now, you have a dad and you have a sister. Uh, you when you make the when you start playing the game, you customize two characters. You customize the appearance of your character, and you customize the appearance of your brother or sister, whoever you, uh, whatever the opposite gender is of whatever character you chose to start with. So you have a, you have two siblings that you customize, and immediately I'm like, oh, this is gonna be great. This is great. I'm gonna have two characters. I can like role play them differently. Like this is the this is the first of many many spots throughout this game where I think of a cooler thing than the game actually does, which is it never stopped happening, and it was a huge bummer because I was thinking like, oh, we're gonna customize siblings. Like first of all, we've had siblings before. Like Mass uh, Dragon Age Inquisition, you had an entire fam. No, Dragon Age Two, you had an entire family. You were Hawk, and you had brother and sister and mother and. Uh, based on what class you were, uh, your brother or sister would die and the other one would be alive to complement whatever class you were and there would be different s- social dynamics throughout the game. That was one way of handling it and I would have even been happy if they just handled it like they did in Dragon Age 2, which I still say is a decent game because really initiative, uh, Andromeda is the first Bioware game since KOTOR that I think is actually bad. All the other ones were variable quality, but I like them all. Uh, in this game, I would have been happy just to have a sibling character that is just there throughout the game. Uh, but in the process of, of, of hitting the matter and the ship being disabled, uh, your sibling is immediately put in a coma. Great. Spent a lot of time customizing that character, and I'm like imagining what's going to happen to them, and she's in a coma. I'm like, here I was thinking they're going to be crew members together, and they're going to go out spa- exploring the ship uh, space together, and you might even be able to swap between the two of them, like in Grand Theft Auto V, where you could play as three different characters, and maybe I could roleplay the two of them differently and stuff like that, which would be really... that That's a fucking great idea. I love that idea. I love my ideas. <laughs> I thought I'd just follow through with how stupid that sounded, just to uh, go full in, uh, self-indulgence there. But... I wanted to have two different characters that could be specced into different like specializations of combat from each other, and I'd swap between them whenever I wanted to over the course of the story, and maybe I'd role play them differently. Like when maybe one of them would be kind of straight laced and proper and uh, do the right thing, paragon, and maybe one of them would be like get things done at all costs and kind of a risk taker and kind of abrasive. And I was looking forward to playing two different characters differently, which is by the way. Not the most insane concept ever, because right now I'm playing Divinity Original Sin 2, a sequel to Divinity Original Sin, so now which is made by Larian Studios, a, a self-published developer. Like, that's indie. It's technically Kickstarted, but they're not gargantuan Kickstarters. It's nothing compared to the budget of Mass Effect and stuff like that. And in those games, you play as a party of characters, two people in the first game, four people in the second game, and you can play those, you can roleplay those characters individually. Like, they have their own inventories. They Different characters react to each of them differently. And right now, they've gone full into this. Or we're playing Divinity Original Sin 2, and I'm playing it with Birdcatcher and Wanderbot and uh, Shell. And we're playing as four different characters with different personalities and different backstories. And if different people in our party talk to different characters, they'll respond to us differently. Either because of, like quests that are specific to our character or like the disposition each of us have with each character because you have reputation sliders for different people you can split up with each other you can talk to a character and do an entire quest with that one character with that one party member and have that not even cross over to the other characters and without them ever knowing it was happening at all and we're doing it right now as four player games you might think of it like mmo when like yeah of course mmos work that way it's not an mmo you can play that game single player controlling all four characters yourself and all four characters have their own personality and behavior and stuff and this is an indie developed game this is not an ea backed game and it does this shit so i am not making unreasonable guesses as to what you can do with the sibling system in andromeda but instead of all this promise and possibility instead of exploring that Instead of exploring any of the things that I say they could explore for cool stuff to happen, uh, your siblings immediately put in a coma. Yep. And then you go the entire game, like 50 hours of grinding pointless MMO quests and wasting your time. And right at the end of the game, your sibling wakes up from their coma. And then you get to play a segment where you play as them while they're, while your ship's under attack. And then they get kidnapped. Yep. You customize a character at the beginning of the game just so that they can make you, they can force you to care about a, uh, they can force you to care about a damsel in distress at the end of the game. 
That's the whole reason they did it. And it's horrible. Because, like, that character gets no almost no character development because they're never awake in the game, really. Uh, you get two... You get, like, two scenes via flashbacks of them with your family for a bit. And that's it in the entire game. So they were like... Yeah, if we if we tell it's your sibling and you make we make you customize the character, you'll just automatically care about them, right? We don't have to develop them then, or do writing, or put work into this. Nah, we'll just take the shortcut to a damsel in distress. You're already taking several plot shortcuts by even bothering with a damsel in distress in the first place, but you're also taking a shortcut about like not even making us care about them. Like in a game like The Last of Us, when one of us are one of our characters is in, at risk, we care about that character, so it's like it's a problem. And we're like, oh no, that character. But in, in Mass Effect, it's like they were in a coma the whole game and now they're kidnapped. I'm like, oh no, that character. Fuck. <laughs> it's... How is that what they landed on? Like, it's just not okay. But anyway, to get back to where I was before, because I got de- sidetracked by the sibling thing, uh, you and your father, because your because your sister is now in a coma, brother or sister, whatever, uh, you and your father and a few other people go down to the planet that you've already established is probably uninhabitable and also has a giant storm on it and is a nightmare. And lo and behold, you immediately get, all get separated from each other when you get uh, interrupted by the storm. Surprising. And then immediately your comms are jammed because of the storm, and you can't be pulled back off the planet because of the storm. And I'm like, you fucking knew it was there before you landed. What the fuck did you expect to happen? And yeah, you land on this planet and immediately you're like, yeah, we can't live here. This place sucks. It's covered in lightning and shit. The rocks are floating. I'm like, yeah, you didn't you see that? Or before you le- left, you were already like, this place is boned, and then you landed on it anyway. Uh... Immediately, I have a problem here. That do, it, It's not immediately clear what's wrong here, but there's an additional problem here that comes up later, which is that they say that comms are jammed. What happens later is that they establish to you that people... The Pathfinder has a quantum entangled communicator, which, by the way, QECs, we're going to hear about this one a lot. So QECs are a concept that's brought up in Mass Effect 2. The elusive man talks to the Normandy SR2 via a QEC. It's a quantum entanglement device. There is a particle that is quantum entangled with another particle. And if you manipulate one of them, it happens to the other one, no matter where the other one is. And so it's a way of communicating instantaneously over great distances. It's incredibly effective for communication, but it has a limited bandwidth because you're just manipulating one particle. And it has the mass effect problem, by which I mean the relay problem, mass effect relay problem of of being a one-to-one thing where one of them links up with the other one and that's how they work. Uh, so that that becomes its own problem too. So the QECs are super powerful, super effective, infinite distance, unjammable communication, but they're really expensive and limited in that you can only talk one to one. Okay, cool rule set. It, it helps explain why there's a QEC in the Normandy, why you have such good communication with um, Elusive Man in a way you never do in the with most characters throughout the franchise, really. And it also explains why you don't just use this, use this thing to solve all your problems. That is nice, succinct explanation for how something works in a game, and it works. It's good. Boom. You nailed it. That QEC explanation, good job. That is normal for Mass Effect franchise. Uh, then they fuck it up in Andromeda. Because <laughs> Andromeda, you find out that, that the Pathfinder... Uh, the, so the reason why, what, what's, first of all, let's explain what's special about the Pathfinder. The Pathfinder has an AI. So they communicate with an AI. That AI augments their body and has access to their actual like biology. So they can they can like basically make them a, like they're essentially super soldiers because of the AI that has access to these implants in their body and stuff like that. But also they can communicate directly to the Pathfinder in their brain directly uh, through through implants and whatnot like that. But the AI is not in the Pathfinder. This is not like Cortana, where it's like in your helmet or something like that. The AI is on the human arc. It communicates to the Pathfinder via a quantum entangled communicator. You see what the problem is here? Remember the part when the comms were jammed and we can't communicate with the human arc? What are we gonna do? Oh no, what'll I do? Use this quantum entangled communicator that communicates with the human arc? That can't work. Oh no. Fucking proofread this shit. What the fuck? <laughs> ah. So somehow, 
apparently j- comms are jammed even though uh there's a qec in your dad's head that communicates with the arc which means comms are not jammed but also in addition to that comms are jammed from person to person but at the end of this planet, your dad will be dead and you will be the new person who hosts Sam. And they just they just transferred Sam to you. That means that apparently the QEC was also in your head. So you had a QEC to Sam and Cora, the other character that was a candidate for becoming a Pathfinder, has a QEC in her head. And also your dad... Alec Ryder has a QEC in his head because everybody that was a candidate for being a the uh, I keep wanting to say Spectre because you're just Spectre again, but not really. They don't want, they want to call it Pathfinders. Everything looks the same as the other thing, but it's called something different. Don't forget the mushroom. Don't forget the mushroom. Uh, fuck that mushroom. Uh, <laughs> uh blurg. So everyone had QECs the whole time. So comms weren't jammed. Because not only could you all talk to the ship via Sam, you could talk to each other via Sam. It might be like slight delay, like, Hey, Sam, tell my son about this. And then Sam was like, Your father would like to know about this. That's it. Problem solved. Boom. Plot hole. Plot hole. Plot hole. Plot hole. Plot hole. And you might wonder, like, well, maybe the QECs weren't installed in their heads yet or something like that. Maybe they installed the QEC afterwards when you were unconscious. And to which I would say they don't ever explain anything. So you can't know. Much like the Geth Telescope, the Andromeda Initiative itself, the Quarian Arc, and many other plot points. Uh, if you think there might be a potential answer, all you can do is have fan canon in your head that explains the, the plot hole because the game refuses to actually talk about the point it just won't so if you think there's an explanation good for you and if you think that thinking there's an explanation is enough then fine that if that's what satisfies you that's great but uh (laughs) there's no explanation in the game it's just not there so you're forced to assume that everyone has qecs because that's how apparently this works Oh wait, oh oh by the way, no, there is a there's a point in the favor of what I'm saying here, which is that when your father's dying, he's like, transfer shit to my son, and your son and so you, the character, gain Sam right there and then. So how could you be getting Sam unless you have the QEC in your head? So yes, you have to have the QEC, which means that somehow everyone had QECs, and what? Were they just off for some reason? Why would they not be on? That's that's valuable information to have. So the game claims that comms are jammed when comms can't be jammed based on its own lore. Proofread this shit. Just proofread it. Come on. Mm. I haven't even talked about the Ket, or the Angarans, or how being a Pathfinder is a farce, or all the... Ba- oh... <laughs> I have a lot of notes in front of me, and uh, we're not going to get to those today. So, say hello to our first multi-part Andromeda. Our first multi-part spoiler cast, I guess, because this is almost two hours long. I could see myself doing this whole thing in one big, and over the course of multiple sessions and stitching it together into one podcast, but that seems like not the best call. So I might as well, like, who... If it's up, if this goes up as a six hour video, people are probably gonna be like, "That's too much." So if you like this ranting, you're my spirit animal or something, I guess. Because welcome to sharing my psychosis of being into this kind of thing. Because I get some sort of perverse pleasure out of this process for some reason, whereas other people would just stop playing. <laughs> so, uh buckle up and get ready for more episodes of this i guess where we just keep talking about andromeda in this post-mortem i i was worried i'd be able to even last a half an hour with all these notes and i haven't even i've barely started my notes so fuck (laughs) so look forward to more episodes hopefully soon and not later so i can keep this steam going i guess but this has been a trip uh thanks for watching like always And I'll see you next time. And I guess leave comments and I might even 
if this is going to be a multi-part series, I might incorporate and respond to certain comments in the next videos, depending on if I think that's a good direction to go in or not. But <laughs> uh, let's begin the healing process. <laughs> we need to cut away the rotting flesh so that we can heal. Stop making Mass Effect games, EA. Just stop. Just stop. Bioware is not recognizable as being Bioware anymore anyway. They might as well make new properties, so at least they're not ruining things we already like. And maybe they'll strike gold again and make something new again, and that will like it. And that would make me happy. But <laughs> stop making Mass Effect games. Maybe even stop making Dragon Age games, although the last one wasn't so bad. Just only let that one studio that made the last Dragon Age game keep making them, because the people that worked in this Mass Effect franchise... Ah... Uh, the good news might be that this studio is closing down. I Good news, bad news. Like, I don't wish people to lose their jobs. That's a horrible, but it's good news for Mass Effect specifically is that if at least this exact thing likely won't happen again. Blah. I'll see you guys next time. We'll get through the other details that I have in front of me and maybe respond to some of the stuff you rise up, you raise in response. I didn't, I never expected this to be this long. Blah. Bye.